Today is a free event organised by the New South Wales Committee of the Australian Evaluation Society, and we're here to promote evaluation practice and capability. Um, we, we're holding a number of free events during the course of the year, and next month's session, which we're planning, um, will be the last event of the year, and we're planning a get together as well on the 3rd of December, a bit of information on, on that in a moment. Um, uh, so just for, for your information, we are recording this session and the session will be available through the AES website. So anything you miss, the slides and the, the video of this session will be available um, through that. I'll introduce the speakers in a moment, um, but while we're waiting for people to roll up, um, just a quick thing that we may get the speakers to come back to, but just to get you thinking a little bit, we wanna make these sessions interactive and informative. In the chat window, if you want to um, answer the following question, um, what is the thing that scares you the most about economic evaluation, which is the subject of our, of our discussion today? Um, just anything that come while we're waiting for people to turn up, uh, any latecomers, It'd be interesting to have your thoughts there. Again, we've got a lot of people in this session. It was oversubscribed, so we won't be able to get back to each and every comment, but it might give our speakers something to respond to, but also provides us food for thought for potential future events. So feel free to, while we're introducing the speakers, to add your thoughts on what scares you the most about economic evaluation. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone should feel scared about it. Um, some introductions about our speakers. Um, we have two speakers today. We're lucky. It's a bit of an international uh, session. Firstly, we've got Ophelia Cowell, who's the uh, di Director of the Centre for Evidence and Evaluation at New South Wales Treasury, and she provides economic analysis and advice to the New South Wales Government and promoting evidence-based policy into practice. Um, the, by working with agencies to improve the evidence base, the centre in Treasury that Ophelia runs uh, helps inform government decisions um, and, and promote evidence based decision making. So while you're all doing that, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over to Ophelia. Although one other thing I might just do before then, if you want to rename yourselves and identify who you are and where you're from or not, um, if you pass your cursor over your own video image in Zoom, you'll see three little buttons pop up on the top right. If you click those three little buttons, you'll have a rename option. And if you want to make it clear who you are and where you're from, please feel free to use that. Otherwise, don't. And with that, that I'll hand over to Ophelia. Thanks very much, George. Um, and hello, everyone. It's uh, great to see so many people, a diverse crowd here. And I guess it's a couple of years since I, uh, this time of the, of the year in 2018, I think that I last uh, had the opportunity to speak to um, this forum. And it strikes me the world has changed a great deal in that time. But if there is a silver lining to uh, all of this, then it's that we can have so many people, you know, participating from much further afield than we uh, could before all of these changes. So I'm going to now share my screen. Hopefully you will be able to see the presentation that some slide, a few slides that um, I'd like to take you through. Um, so before we launch into the main topic uh, and existing policy settings on evaluation, I'd like to just provide an idea of the policy context, which has largely driven why we think the way we do, why the policy settings are what they are at the moment, um, and the context for the broader debate about what the future policy settings should entail. And then a quick overview of how we see economic evaluation, what we what we want to see it entail, and the use of CBA in particular, before talking a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the um, sort of, some of the mitigating strategies to those 
solutions, uh, some of the solutions to those uh, challenges. So first of all, just to the context. Really, just sorry, we, we can't see your screen. So have you, have you been able to- Oh, okay, sorry. I will try and rectify that. Apologies all. Thought I had uh, shared it. Um, so video is working, but not just got to hit the share screen button at the bottom. And yeah, I'm just trying to get back to um, <laughs> uh, oops. just trying to get back to full screen again. Um, so share screen and apologies, everybody. Technology is definitely not my forte. Um, can you see my screen now? Yeah, that's great. Yes. Ah, uh, fantastic. <laughs> that wouldn't have done very well, would it? I was the only one that could see the slide. Um, okay, thanks everyone for forbearing, your forbearance on this. So uh, this is the broad agenda I just uh, took us through. Um, and here is the policy context that informs why we feel, why we think the way we do and what our current um, policy settings are. So what we're, illustrating here is that there's been a string of audit reports and various parliamentary inquiries and things like that over the years. We've listed three of them here. We won't go into all of those. Uh, they're rather heavy tones. But what they all have in common is, and we've taken out a few of the quotes uh, from them that sum it up, that over the years there's been the observation that um, there are significant weaknesses in the resource allocation process. Um, and these, of course, are findings that are based on audits that were themselves prompted by um, the revelation of significant policy failures or infrastructure projects that uh, the value of which was questioned after the event. So my guess is that um, many of you, if not all of you, could cite examples of policy failure or the so-called white elephants uh, investments and the scrutiny of the audit office, parliamentary inquiries in the media um, and, um, um, not all of which, of course, are to be uh, attributed to poor evidence because, for example, poor de delivery or unforeseen events such as COVID can completely change the basis on which you were forecasting things. But it is true to say that well-informed decision-making does require the best evidence we can muster and deserves to be supported with that rather than pure anecdote or conjecture. So this background led to um, a few major policy developments, which I'll very quickly skate over now. The first of which was um, the pilot of the Washington State Institute policy um, uh, impact assessment tool um, in New South Wales. And this was done uh, in starting 2013 to 15. And the reason we did it is it's a CBA model that takes program evaluations uh, that have measured outcomes and economic evaluations and then uh, exposes, um, orders policy responses to any given policy objective by their effectiveness, their effect size. And in this case, uh, the priority was uh, for Washington State juvenile arrest rates because of its clear link to recidivism rates, which were going through the roof. And more and more prisons were being built at a time when decades of um, lowering crime rates. So the incongruity of that led the uh, legislature to, um, to uh, it legislate for the creation of the Washington State Institute and their first task was in this area. And what it shows is that the state rate of juvenile arrests departed significantly from the, where it had been tracking along with the national average. So then they went on to do the same exercise in other policy areas. And so that has been a great uh, success. And New South Wales was facing a similar challenge at the time and looked to pilot this uh, model and uh, it being regarded as the world's best practice. Um, so that was the first big policy response. Uh, it was an internal exercise with clusters, but um, it, it did establish the efficacy of the model and its potential use here so that it was it would be possible to get to uh, something like that in the future if, if New South Wales decides to do that. 
The second big policy response, of course, most of you um, probably have heard a lot about is outcome budgeting. Um, and this is a much broader um, area than the area that uh, my team and I are operating, but it is an important context setting reform. So, of course, this has been a long journey too. So the outcome budgeting announced in 2017 and 18, and we've moved through uh, significant changes to the way agencies acquire and report on their funding that they're allocated. And, um, and from this point forward, there will be a much more, um, a much bigger focus on outcomes rather than inputs, which had sort of driven an increment budgeting, which had really driven decision-making uh, until then. So um, this is the context within which um, I guess the rest of the, the, um, the presentation will, of the talk will, will concentrate. Um, so essentially that shift to my, in mindset towards outcomes for people rather than volume spent or delivered or inputs um, is what this slide is showing with an example of um, how you would just define an input and ultimately the outcomes um, in a worked example. So I can leave people to prove that if they would like to, but many of you are more than familiar with this. So um, I'll move on to how that interacts, outcome budgeting interacts with the scope of the work that the Centre for Evidence and Evaluation is leading. Because this is a common question and there is some room for confusion as the programs in uh, outcome budgeting are very, very high level. So Many of you will be familiar with the state outcomes that have been articulated and then the broad programs that sit underneath those, which are uh, the operations of the agencies working towards those outcomes. So they can be, programs can be spread across clusters. They're very, very high level. So on the right in the dotted line is really the area that I'm talking about where we're operating and talking about today. And so to, for the avoidance of doubt, we are referring to what many of you will regard as programs as initiatives here to avoid confusion with the higher level programs that outcome budgeting's nomenclature has, has um, brought about. So those initiatives are the ones that we can apply the evaluation um, that I'll talk about now to. So uh, a little bit on the role of the Centre for Evidence and Evaluation, how it operates. So overall, our objective is to develop um, an evidence bank um, you know, for decision making. That's putting it very simply. Um, within that, we have to set the standards for agencies to follow. Um, so example, for example, through the New South Wales Government Guide to Cost Benefit Analysis and, and other things, which I'll, I'll reference uh, a little later. And the, of course, Program Evaluation Guidelines. Um, below here on the right uh, really is the part that I would draw most attention to though in our we spend the vast majority of our time working with clusters to build capacity to actually apply those standards in the operating environments that agencies are facing. Because the guidelines that we've set, are very, they have to apply to the whole public sector and they're necessarily very, very broad. Um, but within that, there's a lot of scope for working uh, with clusters to help them apply those frameworks to uh, their priority setting, but also to um, identify evidence gaps and work with them to fill those where we can. And then lastly, um, our role is to then assess the, the proposals that come in for budget consideration. Um, so anything above 50 million, the team will uh, be looking at to assess and advise the treasurer and the cabinet on the relative merit of proposals. And um, we expect to see a CBA accompanying those that meets the standards that we've set. Um, in those guides. Um, these, this slide's just showing how, the, what the actual documents are. Many of you are familiar with these, so I won't labor this point, but we've provided the reference numbers, they're all publicly available. Um, and this uh, is an attempt to show how they um, more or less relate to each other. Um, so suffice it to say that those are the three main guides that govern the I guess what we call the investment framework. Um, so the appraisal um, that sits within a business case where a business case is required, and then of course the evaluation and before that the monitoring, um, if uh, the monitoring where that's appropriate. So what are we talking about 
when we talk about economic evaluation. So we mean CBA. Um, that's the preferred evaluation technique that we use. Um, and many of you will be more than familiar with this, but I guess the key, the key point I wanna make here because it's one, one of the most common questions and points of, um, um, I guess, problems is that uh, people are worried that this doesn't take into account social and environmental uh, factors and is uh, purely based on a rather um, stark assessment um, of economic value, but this is really a naming problem again because we don't mean financial analysis by this. Um, a financial analysis is something that needs to accompany a business case, of course, because you need to know how you're going to pay for things. But you, uh, that is not what the CBA is. The CBA exists entirely to address the, the um, absence of uh, other impacts in a financial analysis. So social and environmental uh, impacts are definitely included. We're looking to um, ensure that we can identify benefits that exceed our costs um, in the context of the whole of New South Wales. So ex post CBA then um, is of course undertaken during, during or after initiative is actually completed and very, very similar to ex ante CBA. Um, and we would expect this to be done with a program before it repeat funding, it needs to inform the cabinet and the treasurer uh, to say that the program or, or the project that um, has run its course uh, or is, is part way through delivering benefits is actually delivering the same benefits uh, as were expected in the appraisal. And if not, then provide the opportunity to, um, to adapt uh, and or cease um, those programs in favour of ones that do uh, do work better at solving the problem that you've set out to solve. Um, of course, you can have ex post CBA during an initiative or following initiative completion. So here we're outlining the, um, the main differences between those. So during an initiative, this informs you um, whether outcomes are likely to continue, if they are being delivered, um, and then inform that adaptive management that I referred to before. And following initiative completion, I suppose, obviously it's it's assessing whether the benefits were expected, that were expected are in fact delivered. But I think most importantly here, it's to inform continuous improvements to achieve those positive outcomes that people need and expect and are in fact paying for and were promised by um, in the social contract they have with the government of the day that, that they've elected. So this is the part that links um, the, the outcomes that the community needs to see with the expenditure decisions that government's making. It's the point of accountability for us. Um, here are the steps of um, CBA and the differences between, the main differences between the ex ante and the ex post. So I've bolded the, parts that are for the focus of, of difference, I suppose. Um, and so obviously in the ex-ante uh, where you're stating original objectives, um, it's going to be different in the next post CBA where the objectives were already set. And rather than defining a base case, you'll be defining a counterfactual um, and so on, uh, leading down to the, um, the main point of, um, of um, of an ex post CBA to use those findings to inform future appraisals. Um, sorry, <laughs> you can probably all see that too. Um, so often uh, we need to think about monitoring and evaluation um, as a way of preparing for ex post economic evaluation. We do also um, administer um, the benefits realisation framework, which used to be administered by another cluster. We're trying to integrate those things now and minimise uh, any duplication and to try to streamline them to make uh, all these guides easier to use uh, for agencies to apply them. So in probably the main, um, the main point I wanted to come to is that 
having said all of that um, and having and being strong advocates of CBA as a way to help prioritise public spending, we recognise that there are a lot of challenges um, and there are probably a lot more than this list contains. Um, a big one is, is capability, um, data quality, uh, is a big issue and the absence of data is a massive issue uh, in almost every situation that we go to. Um, this though I think is not going to lead to the conclusion that we should just drop it and try for a different form of, um, of evidence or multi-criteria analysis or something uh, because I suppose in all of the years that we've been working in this area. Um, it's the first time I heard that we didn't have data available and that's why we can't do proper evidence informed decision making. If we'd started this then we would be there now. So I think it's time just to get started and addressing those gaps and that's what we're doing in partnership with the clusters and we're coming out with a range of frameworks that sit underneath the CBA guide that are much more detailed uh, to plug those evidence gaps and also um, issues of methodology and applying evidence to these kinds of deliberations and we're making great headway. So um, I know that in the questions there'll be plenty of, um, of references to the, you know, the, the limitations, but I suppose I'd put it to uh, anyone that saw those as insurmountable that without making this effort, um, it, it would be a bit like saying we can't, we can't do costings for a major metro because we don't know what the final costs will be, that doesn't turn into an argument that you shouldn't even attempt to do a costing on it. So I think it's the same on the benefits side. And if you aren't looking at the benefits that sit outside of a financial analysis, then you're really not looking at the full impact of the project and you're allowing negative externalities to go unchecked. And so I think that's really where the strength of it lies and uh, why we're trying to um, increase rather than decrease the uh, adherence to CBA. So I think we're at time, so I'll stop there, not to hold the platform, and I'll attempt to unshare my screen. Thanks, Ophelia. That was very good and very succinct. Um, we'll leave questions till after our next speaker and take them jointly, just so that we can get through this and get uh, the, the presentation to get to the more interactive part of the presentations, uh, the, the session. Um, for our next speaker, uh, I'd like to welcome Julian King from New Zealand, who's um, a public policy consultant and director of Julian King and Associates. Many of you probably have already know Julian and his work. Um, he specialises in evaluation and value for money. He did his doctoral thesis in that area and uh, uses integrates evaluation with mixed methods and economic methods. So it's a very interesting approach to, to this topic. He's a member of the Connect Group, an honorary fellow of the Centre for Program Evaluation at the University of Melbourne and a number of other organisations. So um, great to have Julian here to uh, virtually to, to present. Um, so Julian, I'll pass over to you if you want to share your screen and run the, run the presentation. Thank you, George, and kia ora koutou. Um, hi, everyone. Um, great to be here and thanks for the invitation. Uh, let me just see if I can get my screen up. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. Great. Thank you. Now, I'm, um, I'm going to leap in with one interactive piece before we get started. And that is this poll on cost benefit analysis. So um, George is going to pop a poll up on your screen. Um, I hope you can see yeah, that. See that now. Um, and I'm interested in hearing your view in general, uh, because I, I know we're all evaluators. We all want to say um, it depends, but I'm interested in, in how you feel about um, CBA right now um, as a general proposition um, in evaluation. So if you can see the poll, just put your answer in and we'll um, release the results once we've got most people with their results in there. Mm. 
no one's voted yet. I take that that's people still reading or if people got problems with the vote, um, let me know. Okay, people are saying they've voted. It's not showing up to me as having a vote, but I'll, I'll see what emerges out of this. I, yeah, I can't see problems it. voting. Just, just, um, just let us know in the chat window. But it's certainly interesting. We've got eighty-seven percent voted now, and in, in starting to get. Oh, you're seeing it, Julian. I'm not seeing it then. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Let me know when it gets close to hundred, and I'll end the poll. Okay, we're on eighty-seven percent now, and it's kind of it's it's essentially stopped growing. Um, I'm not well, sure how to. I'm not sure how to share this with anyone who can't see. In the poll, and uh, you should be able to. Okay, then I've got a button saying share results. Yeah. Can everybody see the results? I'll just, I'll tell you what it's saying. Um, yep. the, the majority, 67%, um, feel that cost benefit analysis is capable of telling us something important. Um, a few people, 15% uh, think that it's the gold standard approach and 19% think that it's not completely wrong, but it doesn't feel quite right either. And I also gave the option to say it's dangerous and just plain wrong, and actually no, nobody feels that way, so that's a good thing. I would just acknowledge that for all four of these options, in my view, there will be instances um, where that answer might be correct, um, but I agree with the people, personally, I agree with the people who, who the, the majority who said cost-benefit analysis is capable of telling us something important. Um, that's certainly, uh, just have to figure out how to go backwards. That's certainly the, um, the, the view that I'm gonna share with you today is that economic evaluation is important. Um, as evaluators, we should be using it more, uh, but maybe not on its own. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, and there is a way that we can integrate it with um, the wider world of evaluation, the evaluation toolkits and, and perspectives that you already bring. Um, and I'm interested in, in um, sharing with you what that could look like. So just by way of a practical example, um, this is my transport policy. Vote for me and I will bring in a cash for clunkers scheme where you can get a subsidy by trading in your old car, um, you can ride out in a brand new e-bike. You can swap your smoky old car with the brakes that don't work and the tires that need replacing. And you can ride away in a brand new clean green e-bike, or if you prefer um, an e-scooter or even public transport passes. And um, this is my policy, come vote for me. I think it's going to bring a number of benefits for us all. Uh, fuel consumption will go down, um, emissions will go down. Traffic congestion will go down. There'll be fewer cars on the road. Health will increase um, in a number of ways, um, in, including just that uh, people are getting exercise on, on their bicycles, but also that um, smog will be reduced in the city and that benefits everybody. Happiness will increase. Huh? Cycling, um, I'm going now. And uh, everybody knows that. And it will bring about this thing I've called mode shift. These are kind of second round effects or it will flow on effects where people will see other people on bikes um, and they'll think if, if those people are cycling, maybe I can too. Um, and we'll build a critical mass of people who demand safe cycling paths. And so more infrastructure will be built in the city for us to get around safely. Uh, more people will start cycling and so on. So it creates a virtuous circle. And um, out of that, I think there might be some equity benefits as well, more options um, for more people to get around um, in more ways. So what if we wanted to do a cost benefit analysis on something like that? I like to think of cost benefit analysis as being um, a bit like a blender, um, but instead of a blender for soup, a, a blender for values. We look at all the value created, um, the, the environmental, the social, the health, the economic benefits and so on. And we can, we can put a monetary value on all of those and we can look at the value consumed, the costs, and we can put a money, monetary value on that too. Um, we can put all of that in the blender and this, this formula that I've put down the bottom right hand side of the slide. And that's going to give us an answer. It's going to give us one number at the end, um, like a net present value that um, says this is, this is the net value that's being created. 
taking timing of those costs and benefits into account as well, which is that why that formula looks a bit tricky. Um, so that's what cost benefit analysis is doing. It's a, it's a blender for values. It's, it's valuing everything in dollars. But as Ophelia said before, it's really important to note that, that cost benefit analysis isn't about money. It looks as if it's about money, but it's really about welfare. What's going on um, conceptually is that we have this phenomenon we're interested in called welfare. Um, it's an area of research and development in economics is how we measure welfare, how we should conceive welfare. We don't need to go there in cost benefit analysis and cost benefit analysis. What we do is use something called utility as a construct um, to represent welfare. It doesn't do it perfectly, but it does it fairly well. It's based on a, a model of rational humans, the, the, the rational economic person, um, a person who has or a group of people who have individual um, self-interested preferences and when those preferences are satisfied, their welfare increases. And so there's a little more to it, but this, that's this idea of utility. Now, um, when we value utility, we value changes, gains and losses in utility, we, we value in dollars. Um, and we can do that by looking at people's willingness to pay for various different things as a way of measuring their utility. So that's just conceptually what's going on in the background when we're thinking about doing a cost benefit analysis. Looks like it's about money, really about welfare. And so when we're using money as a proxy for value, there are various ways, various strategies that we can use to um, turn different values into monetary values. So sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes the thing we're interested in is inherently monetary. So we're not even really using money as a proxy. And so for example, in our cost benefit analysis of my cash for clunkers scheme, we're interested in the, one of the costs is the cost of the subsidy. Um, and so um, that's, that's just monetary. So similarly, we'll be able to look at the actual spend on bikes and scooters and so on by people that might be the subsidy plus um, what people put in privately if they want a slightly nicer flasher version than the subsidy will pay for. Um, then there will be items that are bought and sold in real markets and we can use market prices as a way of saying this is this is what a market full of willing buyers and willing sellers has sorted out for themselves is the value of something like the price of fuel at the pump. Fuel consumption is going to go down. We can put a value on that by looking at what fuel actually costs right now out in the market. Similarly, um, a number of countries have, have created emissions markets as, as a way of um, dealing with um, carbon monoxide, for example, carbon dioxide emissions. And um, that, that creates a price for carbon. And so maybe we can use that price for carbon as a proxy in our model. Then there are gonna be a few things that aren't bought and sold in real markets and undeterred, we can um, create pretend markets for those. And so the, there are various ways, various methods for eliciting responses from people or, get, or getting people to um, taking them through a series of trade-offs where they can um, reveal their values and we can understand their willingness to pay for things like health and happiness. So there are a number of, of options like this available to us to turn dollars into a proxy, uh, to, sorry, to turn value into dollars. I guess a fourth one not on the slide is that more and more um, social value banks are being built up, built up where other people have already done the work and turned some values into um, some intangible values into monetary values. And we can, um, with great care, um, think about using those in the cost benefit studies that we do, um, but always being mindful of um, shifts in context. If, for example, those estimates came from another country, another time, um, another context, then we, we need to be mindful of that. So Ophelia's covered a number of the strengths of CBA before, and I'll just, just by way of a quick recap, um, it's a great strength that in cost benefit analysis, we're measuring, valuing benefits and costs in the same units. In fact, just the fact that we're looking at costs at all is a strength when we think about what we often do in evaluation where we, we often look at outcomes, we don't as often look at costs. And if we don't look at both sides, then we don't have a full picture of what's going on. We might have two programs that look fairly equivalent in terms of their outcomes. But if we looked at their costs, we might find their costs are quite different. And so then we'd, we'd be learning something that would put a different spin on our, on our findings and on, and on what we might think was the preferable program. So um, the fact that it's looking at costs at all um, is good. Having the benefits and costs in the same units is, is extra good because it means that they are much easier to reconcile. It means we, we, we can just plug everything into a formula and that synthesis step at the end of the analysis is the, the simplest part of all. Um, and out comes our net present value. 
The costs and benefits are adjusted for timing. This is something called discounting. Um, there are good, um, good conceptual reasons for um, saying that we prefer to have things now rather than later, and that there's a social rate of time preference that can be used as a way of adjusting the value of costs and benefits um, according to when they occur over time. Um, that's something I'll leave you to Google, Google if you're interested in, in finding out a little bit more. Um, it's, it's rational, systematic and replicable. And what, what I mean by that is it, it follows a set of rules or guidelines. Um, and so, for example, Ophelia mentioned the um, Treasury guidelines out of New South Wales, but there's a number of guidelines like that, both out of academic texts and out of governmental texts all around the world. And they're all basically the same or very, very similar. We can pick up any of those guidelines, follow those guidelines. Any one of us can can do a, a very similar looking analysis. We're all going to approach the analysis in a very similar sort of way because those guidelines um, and, and the thinking about how a CBA should be done um, has been set out. We will, of course, make some very important analytic decisions along the way, and those decisions won't necessarily be the same from person to person in terms of what time horizon we're choosing to look at, um, what discount rate we're choosing to look at, which costs and which benefits are in or out of scope based on, on what we think should be in or out of scope or, or what in fact we're capable of assigning dollar values to measuring and monetizing. Um, so they won't necessarily be exactly the same, but they will have followed the same process. And so um, you can pick up my analysis or I can pick up your analysis and we can all see what's been done, understand how that's been approached and that's a great strength. Um, Looking at future value cost benefit analysis is very, very useful for this. That's the, um, the ex ante analysis, is, as Ophelia was talking about on a couple of her slides. Um, for example, we don't know um, how many people might take up my cash for clunkers subsidy. How many e bikes are we going to have out on the streets? We don't know. But if we're doing a cost benefit analysis looking at potential future value, uh, we can look at what's happened in similar programs overseas. I believe Lithuania, for example, is actually implementing policy like this right now. And so maybe they have some early data that they could share with us. Uh, we can also get a panel of experts together and we can come up with some assumptions about what seems most likely, what would be fairly optimistic, what would be fairly pessimistic, and therefore what the range of possible um, values would be for in terms of the number of people using, using bicycles after one year, after two years. We can plug those assumptions into a model and we can assess not just what the future value is, but what it might be under various different scenarios. We can even run the model in reverse and say, what would our target be? What's the minimum number um, of bicycles we would have to get out there with people using them to, to replace smelly old cars? Um, in order for this policy um, to be worth the money. And that's called doing a break-even analysis. And I think it's one of the most useful things that we can do with a forward-looking uh, CBA. Um, because it's rational and systematic and replicable, um, and it, it creates this, this, um, this indicator called a net present value, um, we can compare results across programs, particularly um, similar programs, but even in, um, in theory, at least quite different programs. So for example, we could compare the NPV of a health program with the NPV of an education program. I would counsel great, great caution in doing so um, without having a really good understanding of what costs and benefits are in scope and out of scope, whether it's happening in a similar context on a similar, um, with a similar time horizon and so on. Um, but in theory, these things are possible. Overall, the strength of CBA is that it's providing us with an approximate answer to an important question. And that important question is, um, is society better off overall? Now that's of course not the only evaluation question that we might want to address, but if this is one of our things that we're interested in, um, we'd be well advised to look at doing a cost benefit analysis as part of the evaluation work that we were doing. The flip side of those strengths is that um, CBA isn't the whole evaluation. Um, all of the strengths of CBA, the flip side of a strength is a limitation and there are various things that um, CBA can't do or struggles to do or wasn't really designed to do in the first place. So a decision to go CBA is a decision to go quant. We may also be interested in qualitative evidence. Um, CBA is principally about um, efficiency, uh, looking, at, looking at questions of efficiency. Um, People have grappled with and experimented with ways of looking at equity. You can do CBAs for different groups in society and compare them. 
Um, but essentially this is a tool for looking at efficiency. We might want to look at equity in other ways or at least have the option of doing so. Um, when we're doing a CBA, we're using a model of utility to think about value. There are other ways of thinking about value, deontological values, qualitative ways of looking at value and so on. We might want to think about those. CBA is, is a, it's a little bit of a black box method and that we're interested in this, the costs that go on one end and the, the big outcomes that come out the other end. The how you get there, the means, um, isn't really part of a CBA, but um, process might matter a lot in, in some other ways when we're doing um, an evaluation, so we might want to look at that too. Um, I won't cover everything on the slide here, but it's for, for you to, to um, come back to and have a wee look at. Um, CBA is aggregative, it's, it, it's based almost on an assumption that consensus is something that we should reach or that is, is even desirable, whereas we might want to actually deliberate on tensions and differences um, between different groups. Um, it's been criticised on the base, basis that it can act a little bit like a, a voting system that reinforces the status quo or favours the majority rule over the minority voice. So there's, um, we need to be mindful of that. That might, might be quite appropriate in some contexts, not in others. Um, there's the tangible, intangible um, continuum where some things are easier to value in dollars than others. So in, in my um, transport policy, the fuel savings would be very easy to value in dollars. Um, happiness would be somewhat harder. And so um, it's quite common for a cost benefit analysis to leave out some things that are very hard to value monetarily, but that might be very, very important in terms of their inherent value within a program that we're looking at. Um, and then there's the whole, the whole issue of, of complex programs and complex systems and, and um, the evaluation field is developing more and more sophisticated ways of looking at that. Um, one of the ways of dealing with complexity is the principle of parsimony, which is what we apply typically in a CBA, where we're saying, let's make a model of the world that is um, as simple as we can possibly make it without making it totally invalid. It was a just 80-20 rule, just, just, enough, um, just enough in there to make it an adequate representation of what we're looking at. And that cuts out a lot of that complexity. Again, there's no right or wrong here. It's just that um, we might want to give ourselves more options than just doing the stuff on the blue side here on the slide. So my view out of all of this is that CBA estimates something really important. Um, we should be using it more than we are as an evaluation field, um, but we shouldn't think of it as the whole evaluation. Um, instead, we should think about mixing disciplines. How can we bring evaluation and economics together and, and, and do something a bit broader? And similarly to mix methods, so bring the, um, all the benefits that we can get from qualitative and quantitative evidence so that we can look at all of the evidence before us and make informed um, judgments. So how do, we, how do we do that? If we're mixing disciplines and we're mixing methods, we end up with some quant evidence, some qual evidence, some things that have dollar values on, some things that don't. How can we bring all of that together and make one evaluative judgment about whether something is worth doing, whether it's value for money? Well, this is where evaluative reasoning comes in. Um, so to me, it's, it reminds me a little bit of a prism working in reverse. You know, where a prism, you can, you can shine a beam of light into a prism and a rainbow, a whole spectrum of colors will come out the other end. Well, here we're running that backwards. We're using values as, as, a, as a lens, as a prism, and we can feed a whole spectrum of evidence into that, and we can reach one pointy evaluative conclusion um, out of that. And those, those values that we use um, as a lens um, a very good way of doing that is to use rubrics. So here's an approach to using rubrics in an evaluation um, that brings together economics and other qual and quant evidence. This is something I've published. It's something you can download. I'll provide at the end of the slides a QR code so that you can um, find this, the, the document on my website that this, this diagram comes from. This is just an eight step method just to, to, to give a sequence um, to how you would go about first designing and then conducting an evaluation um, of the type that I'm talking about. It starts by understanding the program, getting a good understanding of the context, the stakeholders, the, the theory of change and the th beyond the theory of change, the theory of how the program is supposed to actually uh, multiply value. How is it leveraging value if it works well? That sets us up well to develop criteria and standards um, that are aligned with the intended program design and, and, and our understanding of the context. Now, criteria and standards, if you put them together into a matrix, that's called a rubric. So all I'm talking about at steps two and three is, is making a rubric or, or, or several rubrics. 
once we've got the content of those rubrics and, and really only once we've got the content of the rubrics, we can see what evidence we need to gather um, to be able to address the criteria and standards that are in the rubrics. And in my experience, almost invariably, we find that um, anybody would look at that and accept that you can't do it all with numbers. Um, you need quant and qual. And quite, quite probably there'll be a role for economic evaluation in there as part of that. Um, then when it comes to analysing and synthesising that evidence, the rubric comes back in at step seven, where we use it as that prism, as the set of lenses for um, bringing the evidence together to make judgments. So just by way of a slightly more concrete illustration of a rubric, this is what one looks like. Um, the criteria are, or examples of criteria um, you see as column headings, equity, community buy-in and cost benefit being the, the three examples I've put here, we could all think of more. Um, and then some levels, levels of excellence for excellent value for money down to poor value for money as our row headings. And then just some examples there of um, deliberately a little bit glib so they fit on a slide, but just to illustrate what, um, what this looks like as a way of bringing together all the good stuff we can get out of a cost benefit analysis um, together with some things that don't really compute in cost benefit land like equity, like community buy-in um, and so on and bring that all together and make one judgment. So now just to bring us back to this slide now, uh, we can have it all. We can have all the good stuff that CBA brings and we can go broader and then we can bring it all together and reach a unified conclusion. So I'm gonna hand it back to you. Um, Tell, tell me in the Zoom chat window, um, either say one thing I learned um, or one thing I'm curious about, or both, if you like. Thanks, Julian. Um, if you want to uh, hand back the, the screen share, that'd be great. Um, really great, I appreciate both speakers keeping till time. Um, I know we've already had some comments go into the chat window and Julian's just prompted for some specific things. Um, so please uh, put some questions. If they're questions directed to a specific speaker, if you just flag it, say Ophelia, then the question of Julian, then your question. If it's for both speakers, just leave it open. Um, we do have a lot of people in the room. So uh, depending on the volume of, of questions and queries, as I said earlier, we may not get to all of them. Um, but we we'll certainly try and maybe offline uh, our speakers might be able to respond in more detail to some of them. So feel free to ask some questions. Um, just while you're doing that, I'll, um, I'll just flag one thing um, that's kind of for while you're thinking about that. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the AES, uh, please think about joining, you get some benefits like lower fees to the conference and lower fees for training, which almost pay for the cost of membership. Um, there's the link there. If you are a member, please tell other, your colleagues, friends that you can do that uh, about these free events and possibly encourage them to join. So. And um, George, perhaps while, um, while people are just typing up some comments, um, I might just share a couple more slides if I can just quickly. Oh. And back to you. Okay. So the first one is just a, a couple of resources. If you wanted to get nerdy about um, economic evaluation, these are the two books I'd recommend. Uh, the one on the right, Cost Effectiveness Analysis with the, the dark red cover by Levin and McEwen was written by evaluators for evaluators. Um, with us an education sector focus, but, but some, some broader examples too. Um, it's a good place to get started, um, the very good first reader. The one on the left is, is really the, the go-to text for health economists. It goes into more detail and it's a, it's a highly recommended book. It's the book I, I pull off my shelf first when I want to check something out. Both of these books are the recommended texts in the, in the master's paper that we teach on evaluation and value for money in, at the University of Melbourne. Um, there's a couple of other books I'd recommend too. Um, Cass Sunstein's book, The Cost Benefit Revolution. Um, if you want something that argues very strongly in favour of CBA and why we should be using it, it's a, um, it, it argues that side very convincingly. And then one by Matthew Adler and Eric Posner um, called New Foundations of Cost Benefit Analysis. And when, we, when, we, uh, when I stop screen sharing, I'll just hold that one up so that you can, you can see the cover. It's, it's the best book I've found that unpacks the theoretical foundations of CBA and, um, and really critiques them and says how, 
how solid a foundation are we on with this and, and how might we do things differently with CBA and it's a uh, um, I'm such a nerd I found that a really exciting book uh, one more um, here's a QR code that will take you to my website if you're interested in um, downloading the um, the framework that I shared earlier or any other um, resources on the approach that I've talked about Great. So I'll leave it to each of our speakers, Ophelia and Julian, to start responding to some of the earlier comments about what people uh, keeps them up at night regarding economic evaluation and or any of the later comments we've just started receiving. Um, thanks, George. Julian, um, I can jump in for a minute maybe and um, uh, say a couple of things uh, in response to some of the comments. Um, um, before handing back to you, while you have a look at some of those questions. But um, basically, uh, I suppose one thing I'd like to add is that um, the, the idea that um, I think there's an idea that in CBA, everything boils down to the benefit cost ratio, a single number, um, which then basically decides whether something proceeds or not. Um, so it's really important to uh, address that issue because um, the I think the value of um, Julian's approach is that it brings in other factors and those are important but in the um, and I don't think there's very much difference between what we're both saying it's sort of more of a way of getting there I guess but um, in the CBA policy the guide that, that we administer um, it makes it very clear that in addition to the benefits and costs, you also, and it's in the steps in the slide that I, that I put there as well, you need to do a distribution analysis um, to provide decision makers with information about how in, impacts will be, will land differently on different sections or geographical areas. And if you don't do that, you haven't got a compliance CBA in our view. So the decision maker needs to be able to look at a BCR over uh, for New South Wales as a reference group, which is necessarily the case because New South Wales Parliament is set up in the interests of New South Wales people. Um, that's our reference group. But um, so the BCR is calculated on that reference group. But within that, we require um, equity considerations, distributional analysis, and also sensitivity analysis, which is to say that if you may have got some of your forecasting wrong, um, how much, how badly out will you be if scenarios change a bit? So you need all of that. And the decision maker uh, should not be looking at, especially not um, an elected representative, should not be overlooking the distributional analysis because that's incredibly important if um, different people are impacted in different ways and then can give rise to policy responses such as transfer payments for, say, if you're introducing, um, you know, a, a tollway and but you don't want to penalise people who can't escape that road or are on low incomes, then the distributional analysis is what provides you with a basis for decisions about um, uh, mitigating negative impacts on some people, uh, which are inevitable from pretty much any anything that will be winners and losers. So that's one thing. And the other thing the guide wants you to do is, requires you to do is, is you've got to talk to your stakeholders for that contextual and qualitative information. And if you haven't done that, we would take a bit of a dim view. <laughs> like how, how robust is this really? Like is this, is, if this was made up in some ivory, ivory tower, how do we really know what, how it would play out in a community? So you've got to list those and demonstrate what the feedback was and how you collected people's views. And that's all part of the methodology. So it is quite flexible, robust and, and, and broad based. Um, and certainly doesn't define a decision. Um, it's not a, a rule bound thing that um, determines an actual decision in cabinet. They just, it's one of many things that they'll hopefully take into account, but I'd argue that it's um, a necessary um, input to any decision. It's certainly not sufficient on its own, a BCR. It needs all of those things to be valid. And I noticed some people have brought this into the comments. I think, is it Timor um, has mentioned this, these, some of these aspects, qualitative uh, research and so on. So hopefully that addresses a little bit uh, of some of the comments. Yeah, Ophelia, that's really excellent. And, and things I, I very much support, of course, uh, sound like real strengths of the New South Wales um, Treasury approach. So that's great. And I think that um, if, if there's a contribution that um, that my model might bring to that, it's it's 
adding the idea of using rubrics as a way of, of bringing diverse values and evidence together so that you can make a unifying judgment from the, um, the NPV, from the distributional assessment, from the qualitative interviews and so on, how to, how to bring all of those together and, and, uh, and make a clear transparent judgment about whether that um, represents a, an excellent good um, average or poor investment. George, are there um, particular questions that you want to point us to? There's quite a few there. Um, um, or Julian, is there other particular? They're all good, actually. Um, they're all good. <laughs> and some of them we can come back to people on later if we don't get to them now. But um, but we should we could probably deal with a few now. Are there any that um, common themes emerging? I mean, there's one interesting there about the use of uh, willingness to pay as a way of create uh, determining values. And uh, it's one that I've reflected on in the limits of those choice surveys. I'm just wondering if either of you. Um, oh, yes, strong views. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, was the comment that um, there's some sort of doubt about the value of willingness to pay surveys. Was that the comment? I thought I saw it before. Yeah. Well, I would agree. <laughs> um, uh, a good, the best example I can think of is um, the US polling um, uh, before Trump was first elected and the shock and awe that followed. <laughs> you can ask people what they would do, but what they really will do. Um, it can be so very, very different from that, that I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that without a whole lot of other qualitative or quantitative, if you can get it, information. The best, the best thing you can do is reveal the preference. Um, but obviously um, in the ex-ante situation, that's very, very hard to get. <laughs> you haven't done it yet, so you don't know if they're going to turn up to a new art gallery or whatever. Would they really pay $1,000 each for one when it came down to it? But you can at least... Um, you'd be better off probably using other evidence from previous projects than a willingness to pay. Um, you could do a willingness to pay, but for the effort and expense that's involved in collecting individual data, sample space needs to be really quite big. Um, there are significant issues with that, um, as this audience would, would, would be well familiar with. But um, for all of the cost and the effort, uh, it's, it's probably, uh, the majority of the cases, it's probably more worthwhile looking to other things that are already established, I would say. And um, I've got, uh, some of my colleagues are in here too. So if I've left anything out or um, missed anything and jump in Danielle and Julian interested in your views on that too. Um, so here's the book I mentioned earlier by Adler and Posner, New Foundations for Cost Benefit Analysis. And in one of the chapters in there, I'm pretty sure they go into some of the, um, the construct validity challenges and also the measurement challenges in whatever approach you take to, to monetizing value, whether that is through um, surveys or, um, or valuing games or, or borrowing, um, borrowing market-based based values or whatever, we're, we're always imperfectly estimating um, an underlying phenomenon that we're trying to understand. Um, and we just need to be mindful of that when we're putting all those numbers together to, to reach a conclusion that there's, um, we should be less interested in the point estimates. In other words, the, we, we're not using a CBA to say your net present value is $42.75. We, we're looking for something that says, here's a range of possible values. Um, and it's, it's probably not very much higher than this and it's probably not very much lower than that as a, as a more useful and valid way of looking at both what goes in and what comes out of a CBA. Yeah, I've just posted a link to uh, some information about that reference uh, in the chat, people. Um, thanks for the invite to also contribute, Ophelia. So this is Danielle Stewart from Treasury, also from the Centre for Evidence and Evaluation. So as you were pointing out, um, with willingness to pay, there is the um, potential, of course, to look at um, where there's realised benefits um, rather than necessarily doing a survey. So in the case of an ex post CBA, of course, you're more likely to be able to find out what people have actually been willing to pay for um, an, a CBA assessment that you're undertaking, or perhaps where you've predicted, say, a, a willingness to pay for an improved water quality 
and health benefits, then you should be able to start monitoring what those actual realised um, health benefit savings were. Good point, thanks. Um, there was a comment as well about how CBA sits with some other valuation approaches such as social impact uh, investment, I think it was, or social return on investment, sorry. Um, what your respective thoughts are there? I've, I've discussed that with Jeremy Nichols, who, who pioneered the social return on investment um, set, set of methods. And his view is that they're... His view is that they're very different because um, CBA comes from an economic um, set of traditions, whereas SROI is grown from an accounting set of traditions, and they're, look, they're looking to account for value. Um, they're also explicit um, about um, valuing what matters, so it's a, it's it's akin to a goal-free evaluation. If, if you've read Michael Scriven's work, um, it's rather than saying what what benefits where. Um, what benefits we are hoping to see um, and looking for those and valuing those to the extent that they're actually realized it's saying well, what, what do people actually value so it actually emphasizes within the method going and having conversations with people whereas if I follow a textbook CBA it would um, well under the New South Wales Treasury guidelines I would have to go and talk to people and that is excellent but under most cost benefit textbooks I could do the whole thing at my desktop if you just email me some data so it's a it's a different sort of a um, different sort of a perspective. Beyond that, when I was arguing the toss with Jeremy, beyond that, I see them as being very much one and the same in the sense that they're using, they're, they're valuing costs and benefits in monetary terms. Um, they're looking for the most valid ways they can to value those costs and benefits, even if they're quite intangible. They're bringing them together to say, are the costs larger than the benefits? They're making decisions about things like time horizons and discount rates. To me, they are, they are much more similar than they are different. Um, I think that... SROI and CBA have things to learn from one another, probably, and they both have things to learn from wider, um, wider evaluation methods. And th some things I've seen when I look at actual SROI reports and the way they've been done, they're often very weak in causal inference. There's almost a, there's there's an assumption that our investment um, caused a set of changes rather than a rigorous assessment of whether that is the case. And then if anything, the, um, the SROI handbook um, goes through a set of steps for um, what John Gargani gives, uh, calls giving the outcomes a haircut, um, where we, we, start with, we start with a big estimate and we, we apply various percentages for things like dead weight, attribution, drop off and various things to, to bring this down into a more conservative estimate in order to avoid overclaiming. But it sort of sidesteps the causal um, attribution or, or contribution question altogether, which I see as a big weakness um, in terms of the way SROI is currently done in practice. Um, but maybe um, certainly the potential is there to do it better in that way. I am, yeah, I, well said. I, I'd agree uh, with all of that. And um, I think there are similarities and, and CBA can always learn and there are evidence gaps and methodological gaps that can be improved and, and that's um, the process of growing it rather than jumping from one technique to another. And so the only thing I'd add really uh, is from the perspective of an administrator, um, you're also looking for consistency of approach over time. It's even probably more important than which approach you pick, although I'd argue it's pretty important to pick CBA out of those two because you're trying to compare investments over time as well as across areas. So if your Commonwealth and the state are jointly funding something, you want the same approach. Uh, so it's not going to be empirically perfect. Nobody really knows what the value of a, you know, an avoided car accident is. And we can argue about that to the end of days. As long as it's a transparent set of numbers, then you can keep arguing about it or keep changing. That's not the problem at all. But what you want is consistency of approach over time. And if everybody's using a different method, and it, it, it definitely confuses the capability building side of the job as well, because people might not know what similarly named things, uh, how they differ and how robust they are. Um, and the beauty of CBA is, is, is really that um, you, it, it really increases the transparency so you can see what assumptions are being made and by whom and what values are being attached to things and then argue about them to get to the final CBA. Um, so anyone should be able to look at those and I would argue that they should be published. Um, 
and um, but that's that's sort of the strength. And, and as I said, from an administrator's perspective, if you're chopping and changing between approaches, how do you compare as a, from a whole of government perspective between a new hospital here uh, or a new um, uh, out of home care program for displaced children or whatever and, and you do have to make those calls you have a limited budget which determines um it, it, which there will always be more projects than there are budget for and so you've got to work out how to prioritize those and a consistent approach is really really helpful for that yeah i thoroughly agree with all of that and i think the economic texts um demand more rigor in terms of the way monetary valuations are assigned to um intangible benefits, whereas in, in SROI, I've seen some real leaps of faith. And I was, I'm thinking of, to, to, to use my, my cash for clunkers example, um, the, how might I value um, the value of health? And the sorts of things I've seen in some SROIs before would do something along the lines of, well, people pay for gym memberships because they value health. Therefore, the value of health is the value of a, health, of a gym membership. And then that gets used as a proxy for value, and and I, now it's, I I just think that that stretches my imagination too far, and I've seen a number of examples of that kind of thing that I just think that um, sorry I, I can't get my head around that as a as a valid way of um, thinking about the value of things. Um, there's but there's a just shifting a little from slightly away from the technical sides of doing it to the practical side of doing it. I think there's been a couple of questions about what it takes to do this and the resource intensity. I mean, is this something that someone can do with limited resources or is it going to obligate people to you know, contract out a very expensive consultant? Uh, is there somewhere in between where you could still get a reasonable job done? It's horses for courses. I've done, I've done CBAs that have taken me half a day and I've done CBAs that have taken weeks um, and, and similarly combining CBAs with with other things and putting them together can can be more or less resource intensive depending on on what you're doing and why you're doing it and, and how much evidence you um, you have and and how much time and budget you've got to do the best job you can do. So it certainly doesn't it doesn't need to be resource intensive if it needs to be done in a quick and efficient way. It can still be quite robust a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. And um, there's several. It, it can be resource intensive, especially for a really big um, billion dollar projects. You need certain amount of modeling and things to, to go on and technical work. But what I'd say to that is if you're going to invest $20 billion in something, you want to spend a little bit of money figuring out whether or not, um, what the options are, what the alternatives are, what problem is you're really trying to solve. Um, in other words, you can't really afford not to, because if, if even half of the state budget or any government's budget went to something that was less productive or welfare maximizing than something else, then the whole of society's paid a very, very big price and paid all that tax to do that as well. And the other thing about capability is that um, we've got a, the consultant's question is a vexed one because the capability has to grow. That's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, but if we keep hiring consultants, then we don't develop the internalized capability to do this more quickly. And a lot of repetitive work goes on because of that. Um, and if we shared our work more freely, we would probably be able to make more use of the studies that have been done. And so my team is trying to centralize in an evidence bank, um, the data from previous CBAs. So the next time you've got to do one in a really big hurry and coronavirus response was a very good example of that. You want to be able to draw on well, what did work uh, in a previous situation to support a particular section of the economy or business type or, or residential area or whatever. And without those studies, you have a precious little chance of flying quite blind. So we put a lot of emphasis into that capability building and also developing um, more rapid uh, techniques for CBA. So they're much higher level, but at least you're still organising your thoughts into uh, what are the benefit categories, what are the costs and benefits likely to be. And you can do that, even doing that is better than just throwing a dart at a dartboard and hoping that you've got the right answer and helps you when you've got, you know, 300 proposals coming from clusters of here's what we should do to help small business or whatever. You've got a way of ordering them that's consistent, none of which will be empirically, scientifically perfect, but should at least allow you to put things into an, a merit order that will help you make a decision that you can um, that you can justify and that will 
more importantly lead to the outcomes that you're hoping for. So, so the short answer, I think, is you can't afford not to do it. And we can bring the costs down by being less, um, being more transparent with these studies and sharing them more, not just within a jurisdiction, but across them. So is that something that, that you see Treasury embarking on in the future to provide that kind of clearing house or or centralised point where people can come to and see what's been done before? Is there a, a plan for developing something like that? Yeah, well, we're doing it now with the clusters. Um, they're, as they're required to do, the clusters being, you know, the agencies that come with proposals. Um, and we've worked with each and every one of them over the last couple of years to develop um, a way of sharing this that they that they can still manage their confidentiality requirements and the sensitivities around some of these things. You'd need a degree of confidentiality to make a decision, especially a contentious reform, um, uh, before um, all the hairs start running in different directions and, um, and, and, and you can get some pretty perverse decisions when that happens. So um, ultimately, uh, I think the Washington State approach is where we would want to get to. That's going to be a long journey um, because they publish everything. So if a, if a program is ineffective and like um, say, um, why haven't we closed the gap with all of the spending that's gone on in Indigenous policy, for instance? We don't really know because we haven't really done that work. So my argument would be get that work done and even if... In, even if initially that's internal and clusters can share it, they all have a part to play in rectifying those uh, policies that have, you know, that are contributing to or not helping to solve those problems. And if we share that, at least internally initially, we can get we can move forward a lot more quickly. Uh, over time, uh, I would I would think that um, there isn't much justification for not showing evaluations and business cases to public because it's their money so um, let the debate happen there too um, eventually but until there's a degree of comfort around how we're going to manage some of these things and the inevitable requirements on agencies and to maintain uh, confidence where it's needed especially where there's commercial confidence we haven't solved all those problems yet but we are working through those yes and uh, if we have all of this data then it'll help with that capability and the cost problem of evaluation because um, we should do less repeat work. And so that's very much, very much the aim. Just reviewing the um, comments uh, through there's there's quite a few comments about intangibles and valuing intangibles and social change. Touched on a little bit. I'm just wondering if either of you want to direct um, some specific points around those issues. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we um, acknowledged it's a, um, it's, a, it's a tricky area and there are, there are multiple approaches to that. You have to be able to um, measure, um, causally attribute and, and monetize in some way and intangible in order to be able to include it in the CBA. But of course, it, you can include range estimates rather than just point estimates, which I think is a strength. Sorry, Ophelia, I, I think I cut across you there. No, I was going to say, I definitely have a view, but um, you're <laughs> very happy for you to, to put your view first. Um, would you like to say more on it? No, 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 I'm done. Thank you. Okay, yeah, well, it's, it is, it's one of the hardest areas, and, and uh, I mentioned before limitations, and this is one of them, right? Um, but again, um, walking away from it um, just means those things aren't counted at all. So, uh, if you leave it to an accounting approach, um, then things that matter most to people, like community safety, public health, education, how do you how do you value those things in decision making if all you've got is a financial analysis? Um, so ironically, the most important things get left out without an attempt to put a value on them, as squeamish as it may make uh, people to do so. So an example that we encountered when we ran the Washington uh, state pilot uh, a few years back was um, in the US, they had come up with a value for avoided crime, which includes avoided victim costs, but also things like feelings of safety, um, feeling like you can go out, walk out of your house whenever you want, that kind of thing. So how do you put a value on that? And this is where CBA has to be incredibly flexible because in the US, the way that they did that was they uh, referred to 
um, the payments, the compensation payments or, or um, settlements that would happen in court as a result of, you know, damages or, or fear or emotional abuse or whatever. And those numbers are incredibly high and they can be fairly arbitrary depending on, well, first of all, you've got to go to court. <laughs> a lot of people can't do that. Um, and also how sensational a crime is or something like that can, can influence what a jury will decide. Uh, we needed a different way of valuing that. So we, um, we, we used a range of data, including compensation payments, and we, um, um, that wasn't the only one, but it was also a number of other studies that had been done before. And so I'm sure the number that we, we ended up with in there wasn't the empirically accurate number, but at least there was a number in there that we could say, was could be justified on the basis of these different inputs and then that meant that you could put that those things in as an avoided cost if you were successful in reducing one incidence of crime whereas before that that avoided cost would not be there um, and so I think that's a really neat example of I know other ones like you know benefits returns to education and things like that so how do you how do you how do you value you know spending billions on improving teacher quality or something like that you have to have a way of doing it otherwise you wouldn't spend uh, the money on the basis of the financial assessment um, you would do it for other reasons like legislated minimum standards and things like that but when you want to know when something is really worth doing you've got to find values for those things um, and the value of those things will always be contested as it should be and new evidence will emerge and things will change over time and that's important that that happens uh, rather than fixating on um, I suppose the deficiencies the obvious limitations of this kind of work great thanks um, there's only a few more minutes uh, if there's any other comments in the chat that you'd like to respond to now that says some about some specific areas like innovation um, carbon emissions um, what's been going on in New Zealand, Julian, if there's any particular innovations coming out of New Zealand, New Zealand oh, yeah. that you want to talk about? Somebody asked it, there's, there's some work called CBAX, um, which is equivalent, really, it's New Zealand Treasury's equivalent efforts to it, to what I think New South Wales Treasury is going through to try and get better um, consistency across government departments and, and robust thinking about costs and benefits using a, using a framework and a, and a guideline. Um, and I guess I, the, the question was, have I seen enough examples to, to, um, to have some insights into how that's worked in practice? And I have, I have seen a few examples in practice, but I'm hesitant to kind of generalize from the few examples I've seen, but I do think it's, a, it's an excellent initiative by the New Zealand Treasury and it's, it's been going for a few years and it's, it's um, growing in its, in, its, um, in its reach and, and its effectiveness. And I hope that they will reach out at some point and, and work with me on how to, um, how to bring wider values and, and evidence into the equation than you can do with um, monetary valuations alone. And is that available publicly? Can, can people see what's going on? I think CBAX is something that you can Google, I think, on the New Zealand Treasury website, and there's, uh, they'll have some written resources on it. And I, I have a feeling there's, a, there's an Excel spreadsheet I've seen with monetary valuations of different outcomes in there, which may or may not be on their website. But I think, there's, uh, I think the effort is to make things available. Great. Yeah, we, we've um, um, had a look at uh, C CBX as well. And um, I think putting, um, putting the sort of framework into that approach is incredibly useful. Um, but it is, I think, my understanding is, Julian, I could be outdated here, but um, that it's proprietary. And for that reason, we haven't really been able to look under the hood. So it's a little bit um, difficult um, to know how some of the values that come up with. And that, that jars with our approach with CBA where we want that to be transparent in the CBA itself. Um, and so that's for us uh, a limitation on its use. But um, the way that model works and so on, I think is really useful having parameters in there that you can pluck out. I think it's an incredibly useful way to help ease that problem of capability and, and expense of doing this kind of work. So, um, yeah, it's a, um, I guess it's a wait and see for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. 
you're, you're probably already in touch with your counterparts in the New Zealand Treasury, but if there's anything I can do to help connect you to the people who are doing their work, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Yes, we have met with them, and, and but thank you. Yeah, I'm sure we'll take the conversation further. I'd be interested in more of your thoughts on it. Okay, cheers. Um, question on getting the cost of carbon right is an interesting one. It's something I'm actually grappling with right now in a, in a real evaluation of the climate change um, um, mitigation program. And um, I mean, I, I don't know what the rights that, that there are. There are lots of different carbon markets. There's a, I, I, found a, I found a report online that kind of collates all the different carbon prices from different places and tries to, to comment on, on what do we make of it. Um, I think in the end, one has to put high and low carbon values in there and see to do the sensitivity analysis to see to what extent they affect the results. Does it alter our conclusions? Um, and and it, I think it would add power to the conclusions of a CBA, for example, to be able to say, even if we put in one of the relatively low carbon prices, we still get a positive NPV. If that's the case, um, then that's a... Um, it's a useful conclusion that can be got. Similarly, if if, um, if it turns out that this, this investment only looks worthwhile if you use a relatively high carbon price, then that's a useful thing to know too. So with, even without knowing what the right carbon price is to put on things, we can still get insights by plugging different numbers into a CBA to see how it affects the results. Yeah, I'd agree, agree with that. And we wouldn't regard any um, CBA as complete unless it did um, tackle that question and put those uh, put numbers in and then of course the eternal debate is what numbers do you use but the number zero it clearly isn't right um, so anything that's not zero is is better than zero but um, is a lot of work to go uh, yet in terms of how you determine that and how you determine it for a jurisdiction um, so we welcome <laughs> news that you're looking at that as well because it's certainly an unresolved issue here Great. Um, I've got a few more questions coming in, but I know we're getting close to the end. If, if there's any particular questions you want to um, respond to, um, I will take, give you a chance for one last response to any, any of those that jump out at you. Uh, otherwise, um, as I see on the screen, I think the link's been posted in the chat window. We'd really appreciate your feedback on today's session. Uh, we are meant to meet a poll there for you to, to click on through your phone or your browser and enter that code. And it'd be great to get your feedback. That's um, be very helpful from, for, uh, for us to plan the future. Um, also, we do have an end of year virtual drinks done through Zoom, uh, planned for Thursday, December 3, it's similar time. Um, I think we'll, um, we'll, the AES will circulate information about that and link and I don't know, registration procedures or whatever um, through the regular AES email system. So stay tuned for that one and maybe put it in your diary now so you're, you're free uh, as the Christmas period gets a bit busy. And uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for a great session, very informative. From the questions it's been i think uh, people are getting a lot out of it and it's certainly opened up some interesting discussions so thanks again to julian and ophelia and um thank you all for for coming along and we look forward to seeing you at the next one <laughs>